Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini. Book Three, Chapter Two. Quos Deus Volt Perdere. Once again, precisely as he had done when he joined the Benet troupe, did André Louis now settle down wholeheartedly to the new profession into which necessity had driven him, and in which he found effective concealment from those who might seek him to his hurt. This profession might, although in fact it did not, have brought him to consider himself at last as a man of action. He had not, however, on that account ceased to be a man of thought, and the events of the spring and summer months of that year, 1789 in Paris, provided him with abundant matter for reflection. He read there in the raw what is perhaps the most amazing page in the history of human development, and in the end he was forced to the conclusion that all his early preconceptions had been at fault, and that it was such exalted, passionate enthusiasts as Villemorin who had been right. I suspect him of actually taking pride in the fact that he had been mistaken, complacently attributing his error to the circumstance that he had been himself of too sane and logical a mind to gauge the depths of human insanity now revealed. He watched the growth of hunger, the increasing poverty and distress of Paris during that spring, and assigned it to its proper cause, together with the patience with which the people bore it. The world of France was in a state of hushed, of paralyzed expectancy, waiting for the States-General to assemble and for centuries of tyranny to end. And because of this expectancy, industry had come to a standstill. The stream of trade had dwindled to a trickle. Men would not buy or sell until they clearly saw the means by which the genius of the Swiss banker, Monsieur Necker, was to deliver them from this morass. And because of this paralysis of affairs, the men of the people were thrown out of work and left to starve with their wives and children. Looking on, André Louis smiled grimly. So far he was right. The sufferers were ever the proletariat. The men who sought to make this revolution, the electors, here in Paris as elsewhere, were men of substance, notable bourgeois, wealthy traders. And whilst these, despising the canaille, and envying the privileged, talked largely of equality, by which they meant an ascending equality that should confuse themselves with the gentry, the proletariat perished of want in its kennels. At last, with the month of May, the deputies arrived, André Louis's friend Le Chapelier prominent amongst them, and the States General were inaugurated at Versailles. It was then that affairs began to become interesting, then that André Louis began seriously to doubt the soundness of the views he had held hitherto. When the royal proclamation had gone forth, decreeing that the deputies of the Third Estate should number twice as many as those of the other two orders together, André Louis had believed that the preponderance of votes thus assured to the Third Estate rendered inevitable the reforms to which they had pledged themselves. But he had reckoned without the power of the privileged orders over the proud Austrian queen and her power over the obese, phlegmatic, and irresolute monarch. That the privileged orders should deliver battle in defense of their privileges, André Louis could understand. Man being what he is, and laboring under his curse of acquisitiveness, will never willingly surrender possessions, whether they be justly or unjustly held. 
But what surprised André Louis was the unutterable crassness of the methods by which the privileged ranged themselves for battle. They opposed brute force to reason and philosophy, and battalions of foreign mercenaries to ideas, as if ideas were to be impaled on bayonets. The war between the privileged and the court on one side, and the assembly and the people on the other, had begun. The third estate contained itself and waited, waited with the patience of nature. Waited a month, whilst with the paralysis of business now complete, the skeleton hand of famine took a firmer grip of Paris. Waited a month, whilst privilege gradually assembled an army in Versailles to intimidate it, an army of fifteen regiments, nine of which were Swiss and German, and mounted a park of artillery before the building in which the deputies sat. But the deputies refused to be intimidated. They refused to see the guns and foreign uniforms. They refused to see anything but the purpose for which they had been brought together by royal proclamation. Thus, until the 10th of June, when that great thinker and metaphysician, the Abbe C.A.S., gave the signal, it is time, said he, to cut the cable. And the opportunity came soon, at the very beginning of July. Monsieur de Châtelet, a harsh, haughty disciplinarian, proposed to transfer the eleven French guards placed under arrest from the military jail of the Abbey to the filthy prison of Bicetre, reserved for thieves and felons of the lowest order. Word of that intention going forth, the people at last met violence with violence. A mob four thousand strong broke into the Abbey, and delivered thence not only the eleven guardsmen, but all the other prisoners, with the exception of one, whom they discovered to be a thief, and whom they put back again. That was open revolt, at last. And with revolt privilege knew how to deal. It would strangle this mutinous Paris in the iron grip of the foreign regiments. Measures were quickly concerted. Old Marechal de Brogelis, a veteran of the Seven Years' War, imbued with a soldier's contempt for civilians, conceiving that the sight of a uniform would be enough to restore peace and order, took control with Bensonval as his second in command. The foreign regiments were stationed in the environs of Paris, regiments whose very names were an irritation to the Parisians. Regiments of Riesbach, of Deisbach, of Nassau, of Esterhazy, and Romer. Reinforcements of Swiss were sent to the Bastille, between whose crenels already since the 30th of June were to be seen the menacing mouths of loaded cannon. On the 10th of July, the electors once more addressed the king to request the withdrawal of the troops. They were answered next day, that the troops served the purpose of defending the liberties of the assembly. And on the next day to that, which was a Sunday, the philanthropist Dr. Guillotine, whose philanthropic engine of painless death was before very long to find a deal of work, came from the assembly, of which he was a member, to assure the electors of Paris that all was well, appearances notwithstanding, since Necker was more firmly in the saddle than ever. He did not know that at that very moment in which he was speaking so confidently, the oft-dismissed and oft-recalled Monsieur Necker had just been dismissed yet again by the hostile cabal about the Queen. Privilege wanted conclusive measures, and conclusive measures it would have, conclusive to itself. And at the same time yet another philanthropist, also a doctor, one Jean-Paul Marat, 
of Italian extraction, better known as Marat, the gallicized form of name he adopted, a man of letters too, who had spent some years in England and there published several works on sociology, was writing, Have a care. Consider what would be the fatal effect of a seditious movement. If you should have the misfortune to give way to that, you will be treated as people in revolt, and blood will flow. André Louis was in the gardens of the Palais Royal, that place of shops and puppet shows, of circus and cafés, of gaming houses and brothels, that universal rendezvous on that Sunday morning when the news of Necker's dismissal spread, carrying with it dismay and fury. Into Necker's dismissal the people read the triumph of the party hostile to themselves. It sounded the knell of all hope of redress of their wrongs. He beheld a slight young man with a pock-marked face, redeemed from utter ugliness by a pair of magnificent eyes, leap to a table outside the Café de Foy, a drawn sword in his hand, crying, To arms! And then, upon the silence of astonishment that cry imposed, this young man poured a flood of inflammatory eloquence, delivered in a voice marred at moments by a stutter. He told the people that the Germans on the Champ de Mar would enter Paris that night to butcher the inhabitants. "'Let us mount a cockade!' he cried, and tore a leaf from a tree to serve his purpose, the green cockade of hope. Enthusiasm swept the crowd, a motley crowd, made up of men and women of every class, from vagabond to nobleman, from harlot to lady of fashion. Trees were despoiled of their leaves, and the green cockade was flaunted from almost every head. "'You are caught between two fires,' the incendiary's stuttering voice raved on between the Germans on the Champ de Mar and the Swiss in the Bastille. To arms, then! To arms! Excitement boiled up and over. From a neighboring waxworks show came the bust of Necker, and presently a bust of that comedian, the Duke of Orleans, who had a party and who was as ready as any other of the budding opportunists of those days to take advantage of the moment for his own aggrandizement. The bust of Necker was draped with crepe. André Louis looked on and grew afraid. Marat's pamphlet had impressed him. It had expressed what he himself had expressed more than half a year ago to the mob at Rennes. This crowd, he felt, must be restrained. That hot-headed, irresponsible stutterer would have the town in a blaze by night unless something were done. The young man, a causeless advocate of the palais named Camille des Moulins, later to become famous, leapt down from his table, still waving his sword, still shouting, To arms! Follow me! André Louis advanced to occupy the improvised rostrum which the stutterer had just vacated, to make an effort at counteracting the inflammatory performance. He thrust through the crowd, and came suddenly face to face with a tall man, beautifully dressed, whose handsome countenance was sternly set, whose great sombre eyes mouldered as if with suppressed anger. Thus face to face, each looking into the eyes of the other, they stood for a long moment, the jostling crowd streaming past them unheeded. Then André Louis laughed. That fellow, too, has a very dangerous gift of eloquence, Monsieur le Marquis, he said. In fact, there are a number of such in France today. They grow from the soil, which you and yours have irrigated with the blood of the martyrs of liberty. Soon it may be your blood instead. 
the soil is parched and thirsty for it. Gallows bird, he was answered, the police will do your affair for you. I shall tell the lieutenant general that you are to be found in Paris. My God, man, cried Andre Louis, will you never get sense? Will you talk like that of lieutenant generals when Paris itself is likely to tumble about your ears or take fire under your feet? Raise your voice, Monsieur le Marquis. Denounce me here, to these. You will make a hero of me in such an hour as this. Or shall I denounce you? I think I will. I think it is high time you received your wages. Hi! You others, listen to me. Let me present to you. A rush of men hurtled against him, swept him along with them, do what he would, separating him from Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, so oddly met. He sought to breast that human torrent. The Marquis, caught in an eddy of it, remained where he had been. And André Louis' last glimpse of him was of a man smiling with tight lips. An ugly smile. Meanwhile the gardens were emptying in the wake of that stuttering firebrand who had mounted the green cockade. The human torrent poured out into the Rue de Richelieu, and André Louis perforce must suffer himself to be borne along by it, at least as far as the Rue de Hussard. There he sidled out of it, and having no wish to be crushed to death or to take further part in the madness that was afoot, he slipped down the street, and so got home to the deserted academy. For there were no pupils to-day, and even Monsieur des Amis, like André Louis, had gone out to seek for news of what was happening at Versailles. This was no normal state of things at the academy of Bertrand des Amis, Whatever else in Paris might have been at a standstill lately, the fencing academy had flourished as never hitherto. Usually both the master and his assistant were busy from morning until dusk. And already André Louis was being paid now by the lessons that he gave, the master allowing him one half of the fee in each case for himself, an arrangement which the assistant found profitable. On Sundays the academy made half-holiday, but on this Sunday such had been the state of suspense and ferment in the city, that no one having appeared by eleven o'clock both Des Amis and André Louis had gone out. Little they thought, as they lightly took leave of each other, they were very good friends by now, that they were never to meet again in this world. Bloodshed there was that day in Paris. On the Place Vendôme, a detachment of dragoons awaited the crowd out of which André Louis had slipped. The horsemen swept down upon the mob, dispersed it, smashed the waxen effigy of Monsieur Necker, and killed one man on the spot, an unfortunate French guard who stood his ground. That was a beginning. As a consequence, Bensonval, brought up his Swiss from the Champ des Mars, and marshaled them in battle order on the Champs Elysees, with four pieces of artillery. His dragoons he stationed in the Place Louis Quinze. That evening an enormous crowd, streaming along the Champs Elysees and the Tuileries Gardens, considered with eyes of alarm that warlike preparation. Some insults were cast upon those foreign mercenaries, and some stones were flung. Bessonval, losing his head or acting under orders, sent for his dragoons and ordered them to disperse the crowd. But that crowd was too dense to be dispersed in this fashion. So dense that it was impossible for the horsemen to move without crushing someone. There were several crushed, and as a consequence, when the dragoons, led by the Prince de Lambesque, advanced into the Tuileries gardens. The outraged crowd met them with a fusillade of stones and bottles. Lambesque gave the order to fire. 
there was a stampede pouring forth from the Tuileries through the city went those indignant people with their story of German cavalry trampling upon women and children, and uttering now, in grimmest earnest, the call to arms, raised at noon by Desmoulins in the Palais Royal. The victims were taken up and borne thence, and amongst them was Bertrand des Amis, himself, like all who lived by the sword, an ardent upholder of the noblesse, trampled to death under hooves of a foreign horseman launched by the noblesse and led by a nobleman. To André Louis, waiting that evening on the second floor of number 13 Rue d'Assard for the return of his friend and master, four men of the people brought that broken body of one of the earliest victims of the revolution that was now launched in earnest. End of chapter 2 of book 3